Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. If the last few years have taught us anything, it's that change is inevitable and we no longer need to go to work to work. As a workplace dynamic strategist and the founder of Community, I draw back the curtains on my own business, the clients and projects that we deliver, along with tapping into the knowledge and insights from academics, business leaders and champions of change. I believe that our environments have the power to positively influence our behaviour and performance, inspiring our human potential. This program was made possible with the support from the Alastair Swain Foundation. To find out more, go to alastairswainfoundation.org. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Work Life by Design. Now, as you will be all very well aware, we have recently ticked over into a new financial year. And with the closing out of one financial year, it's always a really great opportunity to sit down and reflect on the midway point through the year. Depending on your business, you most likely are operating on a financial year. So you're looking at the end of your financial year for your business, but it's also the midway point for our calendar year. Now, if you've been around here for long enough, you'll know that I really enjoy sitting down at the beginning and start of every year and planning out what my year ahead looks like. That's my opportunity to set myself some goals, to really think about what I want my focus and my intention to be for the year ahead. Now, this year, my word was all about creating flow. So how can I create things that just flow much more effortlessly, much more easily in my life generally? And one of my favorite authors is Greg McKeown and his book, Effortless. So if you haven't read that one, highly recommend reading it. But what it does is he just talks about, well, what is it that would make this easy? How can I make anything that little bit easier? So that's been my whole intention for the year ahead. And so getting the opportunity to sit down at the end of financial year, I took myself off for a little lunch for one. And it was a really great opportunity for me to just sit back and think about all of the amazing things that we have achieved as a business and me personally in the last 12 months. And it has been quite a list. So we've delivered seven projects through the community crew. You know, I released my book earlier this year. We've taken that on the road. We went to Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne to launch that. We've spoken at events. Um, We've kicked off a number of other projects with clients. We've been doing some strategic work for different organizations and we're deep in the design process for a few others. So it's been an incredible 12 months. And on top of that, we've been nurturing a little baby. So Nashi is now 15 months old. And so he's been growing up beside me in the business as that's been going on. So it's been an incredible 12 months. And so that lunch for one was really just an opportunity for me to sit down, reflect on the year that's been and think about what I want for the year ahead. And what I was so surprised about was as I sat down and I'm, you know, cheersing myself over a glass of champagne, the words just came flowing out of me. I had this, you know, one of these moments, kind of this out of body experience where these words were just flowing out and my pen was kind of trying to keep up with the words that were coming out. And at one point the waiter's come over and he's gone, wow, you, you've written a whole a lot of words here. And I'm like, yeah, I need to keep going. I'm in, I'm in flow here. Let me go. And What came out of me through that process was I really wrote my manifesto for community and for me, sitting there thinking back over what we've achieved in the last 12 months, but also then going, okay, well, what's the next steps forward? Where do we want to go from here? How are we going to continue to do this? And it all just came flowing out. But the reason that that came flowing out was because I created the space for it to happen. I had created this little moment in time for me to be able to allow the thoughts that were in my mind to connect and for those ideas to form and for me to be able to just allow that space for those words to flow. Now, for that to happen, what I want to share with you is a couple of things that enabled that because I think this is a really important thing for us to think about is we're often so very busy doing all the things that we need to be doing that we don't allow ourselves the time to stop, to think, to reflect and to be able to set that path going forward. And it's a really important process. We need to be able to sort of decompress what's going on in our brain. It's like when we sleep, we get the opportunity to cling those thoughts and to file those memories away and to create that space for the next lot. This was that moment for me. It was that possibility for allow all of these ideas and things that have been percolating in my brain about what we'd been doing and what we've got planned to 
formulate itself, to file itself in to create this pathway that we needed to be able to go forward. But there were a few things, as I said, that contributed to this. Now, the first one was a change of environment. Now, doing what I do, I know the impact of a really good environment on your mental capacity, your cognition, your ability to think, the influence that it has on our behavior, all of those things that contribute to us doing our best work. And this well and truly did it. I was sitting in a beautiful restaurant looking over the river. It was a gorgeous, beautiful blue sky day. The sun was shining. It was warming up and I'm sitting there with a glass of champagne. Now, the other thing that I want to point out here is the height of the ceiling. Now, this might seem like a really minor detail, but there is this principle called the cathedral effect. And what it is, is that the higher the ceiling is, the more possibility that we feel, the expansiveness that we feel, because we feel like anything is possible because the ceiling is so high. Conversely, if we were in a much more enclosed space, the ceilings are lower, it's much more compact, kind of like here in my office, the ceiling is a little bit lower and I feel much more contained, my focus is much more downward and inward. So that enables me to focus more. So changing our environment really does impact our ability to think in different ways and how we're again going to connect those thoughts in our mind. The second thing that was happening is I had no distractions. I had no emails that I had to do. I had no one with me. I was alone. I had the ability to just sit there and think. I put my phone away so that wasn't going to be dinging or pinging at me and I just enabled myself to just sit there. I had to sit there in the stillness, in the quiet and just allow myself to be. The third thing, I had nowhere to be. I had nowhere else to go in that afternoon. I had no meetings to get to. I had no children to go and pick up. I had nothing else that I needed to rush off from that space for. So my time was limitless. I had no pressures. I had no constraints around how long I needed to sit there or how long I could sit there. I just allowed myself to be there. So that was another huge thing. And the fourth thing was I had no agenda. I had absolutely no expectations of what was going to happen when I sat down to have that lunch by myself. I didn't go there with a list of things to do. I didn't go there with a cheat sheet on how to do my reflection. I didn't do anything. I just went there and I sat down and I thought, I'm going to enjoy this time by myself and just let be what will be. Now, There are a few reasons why all of these things kind of come together. Was firstly, I created the space for it, which is, you know, a huge thing for us to do. I know as busy career women and working parents and business owners, creating that space can often be quite challenging, but it is such a rewarding experience to do so. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to point out, and I've been doing a bit of reading lately, and if you're following along with me on my email newsletter, you may have already seen my book recommendation on this, but if you're not, jump over and subscribe to that. I'm always sharing hot tips there on what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, and what I'm watching as well. Are you ready to transform your workplace and inspire the human potential in your business? Then why not book in a complimentary strategy call with me? We'll uncover where you are and where you want to be and the opportunity that lay before you to ensure that you are preparing your workplace to adapt to any future. Just head over to my website, melissamarsden.com.au or to the link in the show notes to book in your call. I look forward to chatting with you soon. But the book that I have been reading and I'm still digesting this and will probably go back and read it again is Johan Hari's Stolen Focus. Now, if this one is not on your reading list, I highly recommend it. It's worthwhile absolutely reading. So Johan Hari is a journalist and he is frustrated by his nephew's addiction to his phone. And what he does is he starts to try and thwart that addiction by he takes his uh, nephew off to Graceland to see Elvis's you know, palace and Through that, he's really disappointed because his nephew still is connected to his phone, but he becomes far more aware of everyone else around him and how they're utilizing their devices. And in turn, how he's also then utilizing his own devices in his connection and reliance on technology. Now, what he does is he takes himself off for a three-month hiatus to Cape Cod in north of the States, and he has no phone, no internet, 
and he just allows himself to be. And so the whole book is about this process of this unraveling of his own conscious state around his connection and his lack of ability to focus, to stay concentrating on a particular topic. And that then leads him down a path of connecting in with other philosophers, researchers, doctorates on those who have connected in and done further research around our ability to concentrate. And one of the things that he talks about in there is our ability to allow our mind to wander. Now, this is a bit of a phenomenon that I really, really love because it's about the idea of daydreaming. You know, many of us as children have probably been told that daydreaming is not a great thing for us to be doing as children. But research has suggested that it is one of the best things that we can be doing because when we get into a state of daydreaming, what we are doing is we are allowing our mind to wander. We are allowing it to explore all the different aspects of what is going on in our brain and these little thoughts that have been previously all quite disconnected can start to become connected. Now, this is sometimes something that will happen in the shower. You'll be just sitting there and you'll get this light bulb moment and you go, aha, and it's because what we're allowing to do is we're allowing these different connections in our brain, these new neural pathways to be created because we are allowing our brain the space and the capacity to explore these new connections. So over time, we get very consistent in our thinking. So we will create an idea. This is how our belief systems are set. We have these, you know, hardwired connections in our brain. And the more we exercise those connections, the more we spark them up, what is happening is we are strengthening those connections. So we're connecting them even stronger. That's why we have these set beliefs in our brains and we have the ability to do things on autopilot because we have connected them in a way that's very hardwired. And the more that we do them, the more they get stronger because the myelin that wraps them gets thicker and thicker. But when we're mind wandering or when we're daydreaming, we are allowing these new neural pathways to connect. And what that happens is that it lets us create these new ideas and these new opportunities start to appear. And that was exactly what was happening for me sitting in that restaurant was that I had no agenda. I had no preconceived idea of where my two neural networks were going to be connecting and I allowed new ones to connect and I had these new conscious stream of thought coming through. Now, the other thing that's happened to me recently is I went to Dr. Gus Chavez's book launch and he has recently written a book called The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace. Now, Gus is going to be joining us on the podcast in a couple of weeks, so I'm really excited about that. But what I wanted to point out today was one of the concepts that he shared in his book launch discussion. And it was about the fact that he describes the workplace as what has previously become what he calls a task place. And a task place is where we go and we perform tasks that someone else has prescribed and we are connecting A to B consistently. We go in and we do our job to get from A to B as efficiently and as consistently and as effortlessly as we possibly can because someone has already determined that that is the best way for us to do it. And so he describes that when we go on a walk, that is effectively a task. It's an ability for us to get from A to B, and that is what our workplaces have become. However, his idea is that a workplace should be more like a pilgrimage. And a pilgrimage does not necessarily have a defined route. It has a starting point and it has a destination, but there is no defined connection between those two points. So you are able to explore, you're able to meander, you're able to wander and look through. And the diagram that he put up to explain this, one was a map effectively. So from point A to point B, a very distinguished line that followed a highway to get from A to B. Conversely, the map or the diagram that he put up for a pilgrimage looked more like a river and a creek network. So you had A and you had B, but what you had was this meandering path that got from A to B with all these little offshoots. So if you think about an aerial map of a river and its creek network that kind of explores off it, there's like all these little divergent tentacles that kind of go off and explore the outer edges. And what that's doing is it's allowing us to look for different pathways, to look for different opportunities, to explore different ideas. And it was very much like this idea of mind wandering. And when I looked at that, I thought about this and I thought about my experience back at the restaurant and I was thinking about how 
I likened it kind of like to a hose. If you think about a hose, a hose is a singular pathway and things within it are under pressure. It's constrained and it only has one path forward. And so that water moves under high pressure through that hose from point A to point B. However, a river kind of opens us up to spaciousness. It is allowed to flow. It's looking for the easiest path through the contours of the land. It has those little divergent creeks that kind of explore off to the sides. And so these two kind of metaphors kind of started to blend in my brain about we've got mind wandering where we're allowing all these little new synapses and these neural pathways to connect. And then we've got Dr. Gus's likening of a pilgrimage and again this diagram of this river and it's allowing it to kind of diverge and explore and look for new pathways and then we've got you know the analogy there of the hose being under constricted pressure and flow and what this all came together in my brain was around the fact that when we are trying to do something under pressure consistently, we are like the hose. We are going as quickly as we can from point A to point B because it is known, it is proven, we are feeling constrained, there is nowhere else to go, it's forced in this one direction under pressure. But when we allow ourselves the space, that spaciousness, to allow our brains to wander, to look at new ideas, to smell the roses and see what's going down this path and allow those new neural pathways to connect, that is when we are enabling creativity. That is when we are enabling innovation. That is when our new ideas are going to start to form and start to create. And this is what I want to encourage more of us to do. This is what I want to see happen in our workplaces. This is why we create those places to daydream because this is where innovation happens. This is where creativity comes from. And so I want to encourage you to think about how you can create more of this in your own work life. And this was a really great reminder for me that I need to take the time to do this because as a knowledge worker, and as I'm sure many of you who are listening here today are knowledge workers as well, we are paid to think. And we are paid for the quality of the ideas that we create and we come up with from that thinking. So if we are constantly putting ourselves under pressure, forcing ourselves from A to B, we are not exploring those outer edges. We are not allowing our minds to wander and to create those new neural pathways, to create those new ideas, to be innovative and to come up with that next amazing solution. We are purely walking the hard beaten track of those before us who have proven that this is the way that we need to go. We are not going to come up with any new ideas or create any new groundbreaking innovations because we are purely traveling a path that has been worn before us. So this, as I said, was a great reminder for me that I need to create more of this space and time so that I can allow my mind to create those new neural pathways and those new networks and those new ideas so that I can come back and infuse that back into my work and I can make those ideas stronger and I can make those ideas much better both for my own business but also for my clients and those that I'm working with. And no doubt this is not dissimilar to you. You're probably feeling like you've been under pressure a lot or when you're busy, you just feel like you need to go and put more effort into being in more flow and more work. But the converse is actually true. You need to take that step back. You need to take that time. Allow yourself that space. So if this is something that you need a little bit more support of, I am supporting a couple of great women at the moment to reevaluate their work lives, whether that is stepping up into a new role or stepping back or creating more spaciousness in their life or reevaluating, have I been walking up that career ladder and this is no longer the path that I want to go on? Am I in a new season of my life? These are all paths that I have navigated myself in the past. And so I love supporting other women to uncover their own objectives, realign themselves with where they want to be heading in their careers and their lives. And so if that's something that you are interested in, I would love to support you too. And if you're a business or you are the leader of a business or you could see this would be great opportunity and potential for you to explore some of this in your own business, to create new innovative spaces that do that dance between our lovely hybrid worlds of work now of in-person and at home work and what that looks like for your workplace, they are things that I am all up for and would love to work with you on. So please get in touch. I would love to have a chat and see how we can create more innovation and creativity in your workplace. 
But that's it for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this episode was of inspiration to you. It was a bit of a different episode. I wanted to share with you some of those insights and some of those learnings that I've got. And as I said, Dr. Gus Chavez is going to be joining us on the podcast in a few weeks. So tune back in here. We'll have much more discussion around his book, The Pilgrim's Guide to the Workplace. But until next week, I look forward to tuning in with you again then. 